let A be the following real matrix. So A is going to be block upper triangular. On the diagonal, we'll have two by two blocks, 0, minus 1, 1, 0. In the upper right hand corner, I have 1, 0, 0, 1, and zeros elsewhere. We want to find a matrix P that puts A in rational canonical form over the reals. Now, the big picture here, we find the characteristic polynomial of A. We factor that characteristic polynomial, find the zeros, call those eigenvalues. If all the eigenvalues are in our base field, then we would ask, is there a basis of eigenvectors? If so, then I could put my matrix in diagonal form. If not, we could still put it in Jordan canonical form. Now, if we're unable to find all of our eigenvalues in the base field, we could still put our matrix in rational canonical form. For this case, we're going to consider rational canonical form when there's a single block. So here we just want to do the basics. For here, we'll only consider the case where a characteristic polynomial is a power of an irreducible factor. It'll be helpful to compare rational canonical form, Jordan canonical form. So we'll review Jordan canonical form first. Now, here the characteristic polynomial will be in the form lambda minus c to the nth power. And is the size of our matrix, c is our eigenvalue. Then, the minimal polynomial is going to be equal to lambda minus c to the kth power, where k is less than or equal to n. With that, the size of the largest block that we'll use is going to be equal to k. And the number of blocks is given by the dimension of the eigenspace for c. So that's just the kernel of a minus c times i. Finally, the type of blocks that we use are Jordan blocks. So, we have C going down the main diagonal. We'll have ones going down the diagonal just below the main diagonal and zeros elsewhere. In practice, I like to work with upper triangular Jordan blocks, but here we'll go with lower triangular to be consistent with rational canonical form. Now, for rational canonical form, how do we change things? Here, the characteristic polynomial is going to be the form q lambda to the nth, where q is irreducible over our base field. Okay, it'll also be monic. So that means the size of our matrix is equal to m times the degree of q. Then our minimal polynomials of the form, q of lambda to the jth power, where j is less than or equal to m. The size of our largest block is going to be equal to j times the degree of q. The number of blocks I use will be the dimension of the kernel of the matrix Q of A divided by the degree of Q. So the connection here, if we're in the case where our characteristic polynomial factors completely into linear factors, then the Q that we're using is just the linear factor here. Finally, the type of blocks that we use are companion matrices. So what we'll have here is, we're going to have ones going down the diagonal just below the main diagonal. We have possible non-zero entries going down the last column and zeros elsewhere. The entries going down our last column are going to be related to our Q lambda. Now, our first step is to understand companion matrices. We begin by choosing a monic polynomial, P lambda, coefficients in our field. The degree of our polynomial will be n. The coefficients will denote by a with a subscript, where the subscript matches our power of lambda. To form the companion matrix A for our polynomial P lambda, we'll start by putting ones on the diagonal below the main diagonal. For the last column, we'll use the coefficients from our polynomial. So we ignore the leading term. I start with a sub n minus 1 in the bottom, and then we work our way up. Then we put in minus signs. Finally, we put zeros in everywhere else. 
that'll be our companion matrix A for the polynomial P lambda. It turns out the characteristic polynomial for A is equal to the minimal polynomial for A. It's equal to our original polynomial P lambda. To see the characteristic polynomial result, that's a straightforward induction. So, to show that the characteristic polynomial is equal to P lambda, we're just going to use induction. What will make this work, and I'll leave it to you, we note if I take the n minus 1 by n minus 1 block in the lower right hand corner, that's going to be a size n minus 1 companion matrix. So, this is well suited to induction. To see the minimal polynomial property, we proceed by proof by contradiction. So we'll assume our characteristic polynomial is not equal to our minimal polynomial. That means the degree of the minimal polynomial is strictly less than n. Now, for our minimal polynomial, it's a monic polynomial, so we have a 1 here. The degree will be equal to k, which is strictly less than n. I'll denote the coefficients by b with a subscript. To be the minimal polynomial means if we put a in for lambda, multiply b0 by the identity matrix, then we're going to get the zero matrix out. The minimal polynomial is the smallest monic polynomial with this property, and by small with respect to degree. Now, if we want to make use of this, we want to understand how our companion matrix acts on the standard basis vectors. So, recall, how does a matrix act on a standard basis vector? Well, we focus on the columns. So if I apply our matrix to the ith standard basis vector, the ith column of our matrix gives us the coefficients for the linear combination of the image vector. So, E1 is going to go to E2, E2 is going to go to E3, and so on, until we get to E sub n minus 1 going to En. Then En is going to go to this linear combination in the E's with these as the coefficients. Now, to write that in one line, under A, what E1 goes to E2, E2 goes to E3, E3 goes to E4, all the way up through En. And then we get to En, A sends this to this linear combination here. Now, we could sum up this first part just by saying when j is strictly less than n, A to the j power on E1 is equal to E sub j plus 1. Okay, so if we have a 1 here, we're going to E2. If I have a 2 here, okay, well, E1 goes to E2, goes to E3, goes to E3, and so on. Now, with this, we want to apply, okay, our minimal polynomial applied to A to E1. Our minimal polynomial applied to A is equal to the zero matrix. So if I apply it to anything, we're going to get the zero vector out. On the other hand, I can evaluate this in terms of the A's. So we're just going to apply this to E1. We get this expression here. And then I can use our identity here to evaluate this. Now, when we compute, first term will be e sub k plus 1, then plus b sub k minus 1 e sub k, and so on. So what I have here is a linear combination of the e's. It's equal to the zero vector. Since the standard basis vectors are linearly independent, that means the coefficients of our linear combination all have to be equal to zero problem. Coefficient of e sub k plus 1 is equal to 1, so I arrive at a contradiction. Now, that means k is equal to n, the a's are equal to the b's, and because our minimal polynomial divides the characteristic polynomial, they're both monic, they must be equal. So that's our result. Now, one last item to check up on. Okay, we have the business of this last column here. Okay, which is also right here. We could check that with Cayley Hamilton. So recall, Cayley Hamilton just says what we have right here. 
if I take our matrix, put it in to the characteristic, or in this case, the minimal polynomial, we get the zero matrix out. Now, the reason we have all the minus signs here, if I apply a to e sub n, that's the same as applying a to the nth power to e1. So when I do that, we're gonna get this linear combination here. And you can see that'll be consistent when we push all the lower powers of a to the other side of this equality. One place where companion matrices and Jordan blocks meet is when our minimal polynomial is equal to lambda to the nth power. If we form the companion matrix, we'll have ones on the diagonal below the main diagonal. In our last column, we're going to put the coefficients of the polynomial. So we ignore the leading term, and then all of our a's are equal to zero. So this is going to be our companion matrix. It's also a Jordan block. So we have ones on the diagonal below the main diagonal. And down the main diagonal, we have our eigenvalue, which is equal to zero. So this matrix doubles as companion matrix and a Jordan block. Another place where they'll double, if we have a one by one block with any number in it. One more thing. Let's take a look at the special vector we use in our argument. So that would be E1. So recall, say for this matrix here, if we keep repeatedly applying A to E1, we'll have E1 goes to E2, goes to E3, goes to E4, all the way up through EN, and then in this case, it's gonna get pushed off to zero. So we'll note, if I keep applying A to E1, we're gonna get back all the standard basis vectors. So if we take the span, we get all of our original vector space back. In that case, we're gonna call our vector cyclic. Okay, here I'm using f to the nth power because this will work for any field, not necessarily the reals or complexes. Now, you might want to compare this with what an eigenvector does. So an eigenvector, okay, won't return a basis unless we're in a one-dimensional space. So for an eigenvector, what happens is, if I apply a to our vector, we just get a multiple of our vector back. So we're gonna stay on that same line. Getting back to our original problem, we have our matrix A. So we'll start by forming the characteristic polynomial. We're gonna take the determinant of this block upper triangular matrix. So I'll get that by taking the determinant of the diagonal blocks. We get lambda squared plus one quantity squared. So the Q lambda that we'll use, our irreducible factor is lambda squared plus one. Now, if I want to find the minimal polynomial, I need to only check a squared plus the identity matrix. When we work this out, we see that what we'll get is not identically equal to the zero matrix. So that means the minimal polynomial has to be lambda squared plus one quantity squared. Okay, because the minimal polynomial divides our characteristic polynomial, the only possibilities would be lambda squared plus one or lambda squared plus one squared. Now, that tells me we're gonna have a single block of size four. Okay, we have the largest block has size four, and that's all the room that we have. Let's check that. So if I take the kernel of A squared plus the identity matrix, we see that's gonna be the subspace of R4 given by, okay, anything in the first two coordinates, and then we have to have zeros in the third and fourth. So the dimension of this kernel it's gonna be equal to two. If I take that dimension, divide by the degree of our polynomial, we've got two over two, which is equal to one, which is the number of blocks that we have, which agrees with our computation here. Now, the minimal polynomial for our single block is gonna be lambda to the fourth plus two lambda squared plus one. So our companion matrix is gonna have as its last column going up, 0, minus 2, 0, minus 1. So that's our companion matrix, which is also our rational canonical form. Now, what's left, I need to find the basis that puts A into our rational canonical form. Now, to find that basis, we proceed like we would with Jordan forms. 
So the idea is going to be, we we'll start with the kernel of a squared plus i, and then we'll consider this inclusion of subspaces by putting exponents on our irreducible factor in here. So our next step is going to be the kernel of a squared plus i quantity squared, and that's just going to be all of our four. So to find a cyclic vector for our a, all I need to do is find a vector that's an R4 that's not in the kernel of a squared plus i. To do that, I'll just use v1 equal to the third standard basis factor. Now, to get the rest of our basis vectors, I just keep applying a to our v1. So if I apply a, we'll get our vector v2, which is 1, 0, 0, 1. We apply a again, I get v3, which is 0, 2, minus 1, 0. I apply a again, we get v4, which is minus 3, 0, 0, minus 1. And to check, we apply a to v4. So we'll get 0, minus 4, 1, 0. I could rewrite that as minus 2, 0, 2, minus 1, 0, which is v3, minus 0, 0, 1, 0, which is v1. So we get minus 2, v3, minus v1, and that checks our rational canonical form. So this says if we apply a to the fourth basis vector, the linear combination that I use here is minus 1 times our first basis vector, minus 2 times our third basis vector. So that checks. Now, last step, we take each of these basis vectors, load them as the columns of our matrix P, then we want to see that if I conjugate our a by p, in this case it will be p inverse ap, we get back r. So for us it will be enough to check just that a times p is equal to p times r, so we can avoid finding the inverse of this 4 by 4 matrix. So if we do these multiplications, we'll get each of these matrices, and they're equal, so that's going to check our work.